everyone, here we are again back in my workshop. My name's Colin Way and this is part of the Bring the Skill Centre to Your Home series. We've had a lot of questions about um, jam chucking and about um, buffing um, as a polish in general. So I thought what we'll do today, let's go back right the way to the beginning of our lockdown series um, and look at wooden fruit making. We've uh, we, we made a fairly dodgy video in the first week I think it was of this series a little bit grainy and up the wrong way and all that sort of stuff so I thought let's do a better one or let's try and do a better one so we've got some nice bits of timber here I've got my buffing wheels up here we're gonna play with later on and I've got some friction jam chucking as well okay so we've got two people behind the camera today we've got Finley who's gonna be here for about 10 minutes and we've got Craig who you'll know from Wednesday uh, live streams, Routing Wednesday and Ask Craig Anything, all of those. So Craig's behind there, he's going to be here for most of the, the, the video and Finn's just starting off. So we're uh, we're spoiled today, two people behind the camera. So I'll ask you questions, you know the rules, you know what it, what uh, or how it happens, ask questions, they'll read them out and we'll try our very, very best um, to help you. Along the way today, we've got several centres we're going to use, we've got the polishing mops, we've got finishes, all those sorts of things. So we're primed and ready with part numbers and things like that and links um, to help you out to, as we go. All right, so first of all, let's just have a quick look at the, the timber because I need you to make a choice for me. I've got for the apple, we're gonna make, um, we're gonna make one apple, one pair. For the apple, I've got three of my favorite timbers that, um, that sell well um, in terms of fruit making. We've got fantastic laburnum, wonderful green timber, with a pale white sap. Then we've got some paduk, which is a real blood color. Um, and we've got to be a little bit careful with that in our sanding sealers, otherwise we get uh, a different color sanding sealer. And then we've got purple heart. And a lot of people love purple heart. It's not my favorite timber to turn, but it looks quite nice when it comes to the fruit. So I need the first person to give me one of those as an option will be the, uh, the winner. And that's the one we will turn. Um, whilst you're making a decision, we're gonna start with uh, a pair and this is a lovely piece of uh, oak uh, fairly close to, to where we are now about 10 miles away from where we are so we're going to start with that one so we'll put those away just for one minute while you give me a choice we we have a winner who what is it um we've got laburnum from jill thank you very much is that is that jill or was it chris is it disguised under another Chris. name? Oh, was it? Chris. Oh, it was Chris. Yeah. Oh, right. We're getting okay. to know now. See, yeah. we're getting to know. So, okay, the burnum. So we're going to start by roughing, oh, roughing down. But just before we do that, um, you may notice that we have an eight-sided blank. Now, that takes me right the way back to apprenticeship. So we used to turn these in big numbers, sort of 250 to 500 at a time. And so when you're doing that sort of number, moving the tool rest every few seconds, at the end of the week, that cost a lot of time. So by cutting the corners off on the bandsaw when these are in long section, that means that the tool rest stays in the same place all day, so we won't have to move anything around. So it just saved at the end of the week, not minutes, but hours of, of moving. So that's why everything's like that. So you're not turning a square, you're turning an eight-sided piece. Now, in terms of finding center on that, because we've got no corners, we can't use a rule. So a marking gauge tends to be the easier thing to use. So just set up and then we can scribe on all four corners, sorry, all four, four of the eight sides rather. And I'm gonna bring this up close to the camera. Doesn't really matter what the size is. It could be a triangular piece of timber, it's still fine center. Now you'll notice on there, you have three lines. That's because two of the lines have met dead in the middle and the other two are a slightly gap. That's because we're uh, wider one way than we are the other. So if I dot the center to show you where the true center is. Okay, so you should see center. So it's quite an easy way um, to find center on all of these. So do the same to the other one. And whilst we're there, we might as well do the burnum. Um, for the dimensions of these, the apples we're doing three by three, so 75 mil by 75 mil by 75 mil. Um, on the fruit here, uh, these are 75. Um, what was it, 75 by, I forget now. 75 by 85 length. 
So that's big pieces of fruit. You don't have to go so big. You can turn them a little bit smaller if you want to. So let's centre the, or let's get them between centres now. So we're going to use Pro Drive, a little 16 mil Pro Drive on my uh, two more taper laid here. So that means that it's it's the smallest sort of physical drive that I can get in there. Um, if I use anything too small, then it'll just rip uh, rip out as we start turning. So I want to keep that keep that nice and strong. There we go. I'm going to go purposely slow on the pear and we'll speed up a little bit on the apple. Um, I'm going to minimize the amount of tools I use. Again, I'm just going to talk, you guys, most of you I don't think are going to be in it, this sort of game for speed. So we're not going to worry about speed, but I will, I will talk in the sort of production terms. So the reason I would only use two tools so I don't have to pick up more than two tools. So I'm not always ferrying back and forward for tools. Um, so I think we're at that time. We can bring the camera up nice and close. I doubt whether we can have light on this. Um, you've all seen this light before. You know what it's all about. So you know I can jiggle it around a little bit. And we'll move it further away. <coughs> Just to see. see if that light will work. That'll probably work. Right, right up close, right up close. We're going to come in and there we are. All right, right on the, right where it's all happening. You know what I always say before we start the lathe, uh, turn the lathe on, lathe speed to zero, then turn the machine on, then start your, your lathe. I'm going to be turning at around about 1800 revs. And we're going to use a 3.8 bowl gouge, so a 10 mil bowl gouge, and a 1.8 bead, a 1.8 parting tool. So let's start off with this. Is my interpretation of a pair, and we're not making. When it comes to making fruit, we're not making this look like a real apple or a real pear. It's what your mind says is a real apple or a real pear. I always like to think of it as a Disney apple, a Disney pear. Perfect, voluptuous shape. Something pleasing to, to handle and to look at. Okay, so there we are, 3.8 bowl gouge. 55 degree bevel angle on this one and I've swept the wings back as well. So all we're gonna do to start with, turn the shape, sand that shape, and leaving in the hole points from each center, then we'll mount the friction chucks, and top and tail, what I call top and tail. Then we're getting a buffing, then we're getting a drilling and all those sorts of things. So, so roughing cuts, roughing cuts first. So that takes us down to a true round. Now I'm gonna drop my handle down and skew cut with the bottom of the gouge. That gives us a really nice finish. The top of our curve, so the top of the pair is this side, down here at the bottom, the top of the curve is around about there. So we're gonna use the bevel rubbing now. So bevel rubbing, I need to get out of my own way. So we're gonna start bringing the hand around, doing a push cut. All the way around, one more of those I reckon. Now we're going to come around quite a long way, drop my wrist out of the way, all the way around. That's the underside, so now we're going to take away the bolt from here, so I'm going to lift the handle, and then lift the handle. One more. We're going to round this area now, so bevel rubbing again, handle comes around, stop for a while, before coming back again. So I'm not going to do that in one movement as well, we'll do that separately. Just going to refine the shape a little bit. There we are. 
down. Now I can come back around again. All the way, stop just shy of that center. And then just have another look. Are you happy with the shape? A little bit of, little bit of um, tidying up to do there. There we are, so happy with that. So next, we're gonna use the parting tool. So just a one eight standard parting tool. And we're gonna go in first of all with the tip, and then we're gonna side scrape with the edge of the parting tool. So, push forward. Same with the top. You can't do as much because there's a center in the way. But what I've done is used a single pointed tailstock center here. That makes a massive difference for what or how close you can get into that area. So there we are, that's, that's our pair done. So next is sanding. So let's stop the lathe. Let's have a first look at what that timber looks like with the lathe stopped. If you get jiggled around, I'm just moving the dust extractor. There we are. And we're gonna work from, so what we'll do, we'll sand that round just to get those exposed. So one, so one, let me grab. In fact, we're gonna start with 120. Got a question? Oh, right, yeah. Uh, from Rustic Woody, yeah. hi, are you cutting on centre with your bowl gouge? Bowl gouge, um, yes, most of the time I am. O on this sort of thing, if it's a piece of spindle work, I'll be around about centre. Maybe, maybe slightly higher, slightly lower for certain applications, but most of the time on centre. That will change when you're bowl turning. It is a different um, beast altogether. A lot of the time you'll do an arc when you're bowl turning, especially on the inside. So you'll go high before coming down to centre point near, near the centre of the bowl. But no, here we're, we're pretty much on centre, yes. 120, 150, then we're going to go 240, and then we're going to go to a 400 and then a 600. 600 becomes more important when you're playing with exotics. But I'm going to, I'm going to count the... Um, I'm going to count the laburnum as an exotic because it's that dense. Go for it. So we've got a question from Nigel. Um, are you turning your wrist as you cut? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, one of those things that I think so, one of those things that you do when you don't know what you're doing. So if I'm coming this way, as I come around with the handle, the wrist drops down as I come over here. As I go this way, not so much, not so much. I don't have to really turn the wrist. Um, if we're talking, so if I am, it's just to get out of the way as the gouge handle comes around. All right, so there we are. Keep them questions coming. We're gonna go a little bit noisy now. Dust extraction is going on. You know what that's all about. So 120 grit, then I'm going to 150, 240, 400, 600. Any real exotics or anything that you're struggling to get lines away from, add a 320 in there as well. So here we go, dust extraction on. <laughs> or something like you, then I would recommend going down half of the speed just to stop any potential splits and cracks. Now that was 120, so um, 150. And then we go to 240. Another question uh, from Martin. Could you use a cone center in the headstock? Um, cone center like the fruit chucks. The cone centers are friction drives. They're more for, they're more for finishing the fruit off. I don't personally like using them, no. Um, 
if we're on about top and tailing, then your jam chucks would be a much better way to go. Um, if you're thinking, of course, of meaning, you're meaning one of them maybe, then not really for this size of work. They tend to slip on this big uh, on these bigger pieces. 400. And then lastly, 600. Have a look at that one. We'll have the I'll turn the extractor off. There we are. So already you can see that lovely shimmer and those lovely medallion rays coming through. So sanding sealer next. Now sanding sealer is a a mixture. We've got half cellulose thinners and half cellulose sanding sealer. Um, T Maxminster are going to put the um, all the part numbers up for you. This particular one's chestnut. Um, and I just keep a brush in there. Make sure your brush that you leave in the jar isn't plastic or isn't painted um, with painted handle. Um, so a nice natural wood one like that um, because the cellulose is quite aggressive and it will take paint off and melt plastic in certain cases, hence the glass jar. So don't have the lathe running for this. Keep it off. Make sure you fully cover the piece. Put the lid on your sanding sealer. Put the lid on the sanding sealer. And then a little bit of tissue. What you want to do next is make sure you wipe off that sealer before it dries, otherwise you'll end up with a very sticky mess. So a bit of tissue, get rid of it. What the sanding sealer is doing here is the grain is rising up. So all I'm going to do is wipe it off, take it off, and put it in a box with all the other 150 pieces of fruit ready to top and tail in a moment. Okay, so that's our pair. Ready? Now we're going to go over to that lovely piece of laburnum and we're going to do the same thing. So we we'll mark centre. Remember I've used the marking gauge already on that so I think whatever happens on this piece we're going to lose the white sap. Just part of it. Um, but I'll leave it at the thicker end. Again the top of the apple is this side so if you've got any features that you want to show you can manipulate that piece to, to best do it. Okay, again, I'm going to use the same two tools. And this time I'm just going to try and get you um, in to see the, um, the parting tool work in a moment. But again, let's start by roughing down. Same speed, I'm happy with that 1500 revs, so don't think, oh, he hasn't turned it down. Think about doing a lot of these in repetition. I know this lay speed is right for that piece now. I can continue. So roughing down, checking for round, keep it there. Now we drop the handle down and skew cut. So we've got a nice finish. Now let's just stop to prove that. Okay, that finish is untorn, unbroken, and we've got no turning lines as such. It's like a skewed finish. So now, we're going to have the wide part of the piece of fruit about there, so slightly biased toward the tailstock. Bevel rubbing, and then slowly push the handle away. There's my contact area. And that's the reason I'm using a thick bowl gouge over a spindle gouge. If I was using a spindle gouge and trying to do the same thing at that point, we get so much vibration and chatter, um, it would be quite off-putting. So that's the reason for the bowl gouge. So that's that nice curve there. So again, we're gonna lift the handle, just to remove some of that waste. Then bevel rub again. Remember, I've got to get out of my own way as I drop the handle 
you bring your hand around as far as it'll go. There we are, happy with that. Now, let's get, see if I can get you seeing what's happening here. So parting tool, I'm gonna to push forward. But then side stroke. Same on the back. There we are. That's all the turning on that particular piece done. So again, we'll go to sanding. Same braids. Sanding or dust, dust extractor on again. And So then it won't take too much heat, so just keep that paper moving. Don't forget, you've always got the ability, if you want to, if you want to check something, stop the lane and have a look, make sure now we've got some tears, so we're going to have to go further. I've got a message from uh, David, or a question from David. Um, side scrape. Yes. Are you using the edge of the tool rather than the sharp tip? Yes. Well, actually, the... Direct the grape my edge sharpen. That's, yeah, that's just right. So the tip, yeah, that's a bit of sharpen, but you think about it, you're sharpening the whole of that surface. This, that makes this bit sharp as well. So without tilting over too much, we can just use either of those two edges um, and it creates a really nice scrape on end grain. Just don't tilt over too much, just enough to get it cutting. So now moving on to <laughs> 150. Just fancy a day out. <laughs> Did you fancy a day out? Questions. I think he just tempted me with cakes. <laughs> That's what it was. Cakes. They've not materialised yet. I've been promising cakes for the last two days. Though, <laughs> even though we've got there yet. There we are. All nice. So sanding sealer. One thing. Whilst we're talking sanding sealer, um, I mentioned earlier about the paduk as a timber. A beautiful colour and a really vibrant um, colour as well um, but it, it does transfer colour into the sanding sealer that was clear before my paduk um, uh, apples and pears and you can see it's gone pink in colour now um, so just be aware of that another question so we've got a couple of questions oh, here right. I've got round finishing yeah. how do you know when to change grits <sighs> So, it, it's, re it's a really, really tricky one, that one. Um, to start with, the best advice I can give would be to stop the lathe and look. You get to a certain point when you've done enough things like this that you know, well, that'd be fine, you won't have to turn the lathe, then you go on to the next one. However, if that happens, if you don't do that, you don't check, and you get to the end and you can still see scratches, that means you're going through the grits too quickly. So go back to not the, la not the first grit, but maybe the second one in it and, and start again. Um, 
it, it, that, that's it really. You know, you've got to check regularly. Um, move the paper often. And that's the other thing. Don't be too stingy with your paper, but likewise, don't be too wasteful with it at the same time. I would tend always to go with a material backed abrasive because the, the paper backed abrasive breaks down far too quick. And you'll find with paper backed abrasive that the grip would be good, but it would have left the paper be on the floor. The, pa the paper is the first thing that breaks down. With material backed, it lasts so much longer. Um, but yeah, that's it. There we are, that's nice and dry. So we can move on to friction chucks. Now don't be too put off with a friction chuck. I'm not gonna make one for you here today. We simply don't have the time in an hour, um, but they're a very simple bit of wood turning that lasts you all of your turning life, or certainly mine have anyway. Um, and there's two there. This one I've had for about, probably about 15, 16 years now. Um, I know that because it's from a piece of myrtle. As a company, Axminster haven't sold myrtle for about that length of time. And so that would have been the only place I'd have got that. So that one's lasted me a long time. You see how thick they are, left them quite chunky, hold them in a big set of jaws, and it has a taper. And the taper is the bit that grips your piece of work. So then when finished, you don't have any tooling uh, marks on the piece of uh, turning at all. I use them for all sorts of things. They're a great work holding um, solution um, and just make different, um, different chucks for different size pieces of fruit or different projects. Don't use timbers like chestnut and ash, they will always split. Even things like pine, that sort of stuff, it'll split all the time. That's a piece of myrtle that I use there, a bit of acacia, but beech, sycamore, um, uh, or are we, elm is a good one, oak is a good one, but those types of materials, they'll, they'll last you forever. So we're gonna see in a minute which one is the right size. We'll start with the apple and then we'll do the pear. So let's put a set of large jaws on, and in this case, I'm gonna use a set of gripper type jaws and this is gripper type G. There we are and let's have a look. I reckon we're probably close. That one's going to work so that's the one we're going to use. That just slots in there and once you've made it doesn't matter whether they go slightly oval they're all slightly oval but that's going to help with the grip anyway. So don't be too precious about that. Um, to make them, start by drilling through and then hollow out like you would do a normal hollow form or bowl, that sort of thing. Um, and it's really, like I say, once you've made one, it's with you forever. Okay, so one other thing you need is a, a little ejector stick. Don't use your knockout bar because your knockout bar will mark the pieces of fruit. So a bit of beach down, in this case it's a bit of, um, of eight mil beached out and the tip of it slightly radiused. Okay, okay, next question. Yeah, after you've uh, rough turned wet or green logs or green material, yeah. what do you use to seal them until they kind of dry out? So, so, um, so if I'm rough turning, uh, let's go, let's go with a big pot like that. So hollow forms and fat crates, I want to just pan back a little mm. bit, let's have a look. So I've got nothing at the moment in here sealed. Okay, all of the rough turn bowls that we've got here are just left um, to dry. And they do, I'll be honest, they do get turned pretty quickly. If you remember right the way back at the beginning of this series, um, we were turning the, the palm. And that palm is beginning to get a nice degree of, of dryness. It hasn't started moving too much yet, but it's, it's getting there. So quite nice. Um, when we can return that, you never know, we might even be able to return that in the same series. But these were turned back in uh, uh, February, and you can just start to see how oval that they're starting to go now. Um, so that just sort of dictates that, you know, okay, we're down to the, the last 30%, and I'd be happy with turning that now. Um, bowls, I would use something like a PVA, an end seal, end seal's a product from Chestnut, PVA um, glue, you know the glue, if there's builders out there, you'll know PVA for, 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 which you add to your, your mortar, um, that sort of thing. Any, any um, old paint on the end grain. You don't have to completely cover the thing, otherwise you'll not let it dry out at all, but end grain only, all right? But on these, I've not done anything with them at all. 
Um, they're in this workshop. It's a fairly cool workshop because it's a stone built workshop anyway, so it doesn't get too hot. But if you've got a very hot workshop, try and keep them down low. Okay. Right, so our pieces of fruit. That piece of stick that I was mentioning earlier, so we're coming all the way through the headstock of the lathe. That's for me, if I'm buying a machine, I will have to have a lathe with a hollow headstock, it's part of how I work. So the knockout stick is coming through. And what we're going to do is use that stick as my left hand, support through to that point, roughly center up. Yeah. Um, just another one on the uh, on the previous question, really. Just yeah. a, 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 what percentage of moisture are they ready to turn? It depends what you want. If you need a precision fit box, so you're making a top and a bottom, then you need to be down to sort of almost ten percent, which is really tricky. So you rough turn and then, then you know leave it to dry for a while. The bowls I'll turn up at fifteen percent. It'll be fine. And there's be a little bit of movement on them and even a little bit of texturing if you've got any rippling on the, the surface of any of the pieces. So anything from that really. And do you use a moisture meter? I don't, no, I use my, um, my, my experience, which is not a great answer, I know. Um, but I lift the piece up, um, feel, if, it's, it feels if, it's, if it feels light enough, then I'm ready to go. You can. If you start using moisture meters, um, you'll need to start um, checking on a regular base. Mark the, the um, oh, what do they call it, uh, specific gravity, and you can find um, specific gravity measurements for each timber um, on the internet, or if you get the right books, you can. It's a little bit complicated for me. I will just pick it up and feels if it feels light enough, I'm ready to go. Okay, a little bit out of true, makes no odds. So all I'm gonna do is a glancing blow, and only one, with the mallet. That's our grip. And now we're going to take that centre away, that section that we've made away. There we are. Get rid of our tail stop. Okay, perfect. And I'm going to use this time a slightly smaller six mil gouge. Now look at the sweep on that one. So that's more like an Ellsworth type of sweep. Wings are coming all the way back. That's now giving me a nice point on the end, which I can get right in for detail. So this is the back. Turn that one on. Okay, and we can start to use, get the light, so if it's bleaching out too much, say. And nice small touch, remember you're holding Quick question. Yeah. Could you use the tailstock center to align the apple in the jam chuck? You could do. Um, it's a bit fiddly. It doesn't need to be overly accurate. You saw then I gave it one tap. Um, it just takes a little bit away from the making, a lot of time and, every, and everything. Yeah, but you could do. It would work. Um, but I don't think we need to be, I'll, I'll show you again in a minute. We don't need to be overly fussy with the accuracy. So 100, sorry, 120. There, finishing grades, you can see how quick this is. There we are, done. A little bit of sealer. the lathe off don't do it with the lathe running now we'll keep up turning don't let that sealer drip down between the join of the chuck and the piece of fruit wipe it off job done what's happening with the sanding sealer is just tap this through so just one swift tap what's happening with the sanding sealer is that it's raising the grain you're in a minute when we start buffing are going to use an abrasive compound and that abrasive compound is going to take away any risen grain there we are so you saw what i done there just jigged it around till it was nearly right and then we're going to give it a tap done if you tap it lots of times what you'll end up doing is start damaging it when you take it out the the, the jam chuck um or split the jam chuck
There we go. There's the benefit of having that point on the bowl gouge. We can get right the way in. So, abrasive it again. Another question, if for me. Yeah. Keith has asked, uh, what um, angles are your spindle gouges? Spindle and gouges, um, they're 65 degrees. They're quite extra, quite pointed. Here we are, 250, 240. I bypassed the 120 on that one, we didn't need it. Let me get your spindle gouge. We were using bowl gouges a minute ago for the shaping, but my spindle gouges are there. Um, I've had a question for me, actually. Okay. Sorry. Um, gentleman asked if I could show during one of my sessions the setting up of the Tormec uh, setup, the Tormec jigs on, on a dry grinder. Yeah. So similar to the setup you've got uh, in use then. Right. Absolutely, I can do that in a couple of weeks. I'm off next week, but I can most definitely, uh, most definitely do that for you. It's um, probably my new favorite. Um, sharpening technique. I love the tall neck and I'll always, if I'm doing a demonstration or going somewhere, treat the tools to a nice sharpen with the tall neck. Um, but if you couple, hang around a second, right? if you couple the trade series up with the, what we call a BGK 400, which is this set up here, all those lovely tall neck jigs, and there isn't any better in my opinion, all those lovely Tormet jigs can be used on the machine and the CBM wheel gives the closest thing I've found um, to a Tormet, Tormet setter. But then you've got the added bonus of being able to reshape on the coarse side. So you get best of both worlds really. It just means you don't need two machines. Um, and I love it. And with a CBM you get such little amount of heat um, and I barely see any sparks at all. So, you know, it's a completely different setup of CBM wheel. That's 180 grit, that one. So another question, um, is there a preferred bowl gouge um, make or, or, or style so you can get that long sweep back? Um, well, you can get it with all, with all um, gouges. It depends on your grind, that's why you, you grind that shape. Um, but in terms of bowl gouges I prefer, I, the, I'm not gonna talk make so much, but styles. So you have two types of, let's go through the big gouge, as you can see, you'll have two types of flute. You'll have a U and you'll have a V. I tend to prefer the V because it leaves more material in the actual main shaft of the, the gouge, where the U tend to take a lot more away, you get a little bit more vibration. Um, so for me, that's what I go for. I use a lot of crown. I'm a bit of a fan of crown because I like the the balance between the handles of the tools and the steel of the tools. Um, and obviously the Axminster ones are made by the same people, by crown. Um, it, yeah, I just like it. But again, you know, um, Henry Taylor, um, Sorby, any of those guys, you're going to get a good quality tool, which with a, whichever one you use, you just have to shape it to your own liking. There we are. Uh, so another question, actually, one for me, I'm afraid. Sorry, I'm going to take over your session. Yeah, um, just asked if if I'm off next week, uh, so I won't be doing a, a live session next week. I've pre-recorded it this morning, so I still will continue with the Spice Rack project. Um, it, it still will happen, don't worry. We'll still be going week on week. Same thing, this is the pair now. So, same idea, we've got 20 minutes left, so let's get this one done. And they're up again. And another question about the, the kind of Tormek setup, can you get the long bar? Well, that's a yes, you can buy the long kind of F bar, can't you? Yeah, so you can get that on its own. You can get that as, um, like I was just referring to a product called a BGK 400. Um, the BGK 400 is basically for wood turners. 
that has the stand for the bar, it has the bar, it has all the um, the jigs for us wood turners as well. So it's complete setup ready for your grinder. There's also, is it a BGM 100? BGM 100, yeah. Which is just the little stand and the bar. So if you've got a tall mech and you've got the jigs already, then that's the one to go for. Team Axminster, are you there? Can you put those products up? Sorry. Yeah, please, yeah. BGK um, 400 and BGM 100. BGM, BGM 100, I think it is, yeah. yeah. Would you use the same kind of technique for turning eggs? Yes. I guess you would. So this is, so day one, my apprenticeship, we've gone over that, that was lace bobbins. Um, the following week was pretty much eggs. So nowadays people collect apples and pears, um, or collect timber in the shape of apples and pears. It used to be wooden eggs. And wooden eggs are one of the hardest shapes to, to make without making them look like torpedoes um, or balls, that sort of thing. So that was, that was one of the things. And it was these that we held them in. And also vases, so wooden vase shapes, same things, just to take the tidy the bottom up and put a bit of detail on the bottom. So absolutely, anything you can think of that needs some sort of hold point. I don't think I've done that accurately. Right, let's have a look. That's not accurate in any way. So I'm just still going to turn. It just shows you how unimportant this is. I'll also argue that when have you ever seen a perfectly round apple or pear? <laughs> there we are. Now, my best advice, if that should come out of the chuck, my best advice, what I used to say was don't panic. But unfortunately, panicking is not a voluntary thing, so you're either going to panic or not. Um, best thing to do is just hold the heel of the chisel against it, it'll suddenly pick up in the chuck and uh, you just then turn the lathe off and recess it. Um, yes, every now and again I'll lose one, but it's not a massive drama. You can usually put them back between centres to tidy them up again. So another question, why wouldn't you use a homemade kind of screw chuck? So uh, that's, yeah, so screw chucks are the, are the common way for turning fruit. What I believe though, when we're going back to, um, going back to, to eggs, with an egg, with apples and pears, it's all about the shape. They're the things that sell them if you're selling your pert work. They're the things that people look at. If I'm turning between centers, I can see the shape beautifully. If I've got a screw chuck there, it masks that back curve and you can't see it. It's also the way I was brought up with on my apprenticeship. That's how I was taught to turn. So there's many reasons, and I just feel that like I can turn them quicker, which isn't the answer for everybody, of course. I feel I can turn them quicker in with this technique. So that's my answer for that one. Mm -hmm. and, and a question from Bill. Um, do you leave the push-out rod in the lathe uh, when you're shaping the workpiece? I guess, well, that's what the rattle is. Yeah. In my workshop, yes, I do. If I'm going to a club or if I'm at a show where I'm demonstrating, no, I won't. Because in my workshop, normally, it's only me. I'm stood here. Knockout bar is way over there. It's never come out. But if, say, for instance, one day it does, it's not going to go anywhere near me. It's a wooden knockout bar. And for speed, I'll leave it in there. Like I say, if I'm demonstrating to a club, it comes out every single time. Right, really important chuck to me now is this one. We're going to do loads of things with this now. First of all, I'm going to drill the pieces and we're going to drill them out to about, let's go three mil. I'm going to use the drill in the chuck. Now, there's lots of safety implications here. First of all, if you're using small drill bits like this, don't expose too much. So use as much, or expose as much of the drill that you need to use. Secondly, don't use a blunt one, because if you use a blunt one, that means you're automatically going to push hard. And then if you slip, you put a drill through your hand. Um, I don't like using a cordless drill here because, again, my hand's exposed. So it's fingertips, nice, quick lay, and position that centrally. Let the drill bit do the work. Start straight and then tilt and finish the cup. So no pressure. We don't want any chance of slipping. Job done on that one. Same thing here. So this one's three mil. Same again, push gently. Once you've got it in straight, then you can tilt, get your angle. Done. Okay. 
three mil in that side. On the bottom, if you're going to put a, um, uh, a clove in there, you want a two mil hole. Don't put the big three mil in, otherwise you'll see the hole all the time. First job with that chuck. Next job, I'm going to turn a couple of stems. So for the stems, I'm going to use little quarter inch stock, which I have here somewhere. Let's go for, let's go for, I know, it's a little bit big. That's a little bit too big, but that's all I've got on hand at the moment. So we're going to go for that. This is a piece of plantation grown rosewood. What I do most of the stems with actually. So we'll turn it down. It's a bit of waste wood that I had from a demo yesterday actually. So turn that down, go to a quarter inch gouge. So these stems are normally made from um, quarter inch material. So six mil. So I'll tell you what I'll do, we're just going to turn that around and use the other end as well. Craig, do you want to come in as, a little bit closer or as close as we can? Mm, this is getting sweet. a little bit wee now. Yep, it's just... So then back to the old favourite, so we're going to go for the skew. A message from Bill, or a question from Bill. Would the F pen jaws do the same job uh, holding the drill bit and stems? The F pen jaws. Uh, you've got me there. What would? They would. Okay, those are the pin jaws. That's the ones, I think it's probably the ones he meant. Um, pen jaws, no. Um, F jaws, no. But the, those would, yes. There we are. So let's quickly, now you can sand that. A little bit of sanding, um, a friction polish on those if you want to. Then we're just going to part off. And we are going to sand that in a moment. But what we want is that to go in to our pair. Nice little angle. We'll be sanding, like I said, we want to sand a little taper on the top so it looks more like a, a stem. Well, we're going to do a little dumpy one on this one. There's all sorts of things you could use instead of turning yourself a stem, of course, little branch sections. Little twigs, they're a good one. Seen that used an awful lot. There we are, part that one off. Again, that can be placed in, we'll sand that up in a second. However, whilst we've got our chuck in, so remember the jaws we just looked at, pin jaws. I would always say, if you don't have these and you don't have pin jaws and you're trying to decide which ones to go for, Go for the pin jaws. The pin jaws are going to be far safer to your hands. I was brought up with these. They are knuckle dusters, and when you catch a knuckle on one of those corners, it really hurts. If you catch a nail on it, same thing. So go for the pin jaws. We've got all those modern equivalents now. Um, far better for your, for your fingers. Right, so polishing. Let's start both of those. We're going to use two different types of polish. That means two different wheels. We have both stitched, okay. On the pale one for the piece of oak, we're going to use a polish called Buff, and the dark one Tripoli. And then when it comes to when it comes to um, buffing, we're going to then use a loose leaf mop with Carnauba stick. Liberon chestnut. Hampshire Sheen, it's all Carnauba. 
well, if you search Carnauba, that's what it'll be. So if we use the buff first on the pair, lay speed down, and you want to be polishing and buffing at about 1200 revs. A little bit of buff. And this is an abrasive compound. T-Max Minster should be putting the part numbers up now. So that would be the polish. You can see that sort of shine that we're getting. That's not the final shine. The best shine is going to come from the Carnauba wax. So now we're going to move to Tripoli, and this is for the apple. This is now a different type of polishing stick. Tripoli, general use for Tripoli is uh, first stage plastics and soft metals, so coppers and brasses and things like that. Quick question. On the stitched mops, just a little coarse, a little hard and abrasive for, for this sort of work? No, no we want that that a, a, a abrasive um, element there. This is, um, if you're looking by the way, these are um, grade G. There we are, again, you can start to see that shine. Now this is the magic bit, and this is, this is a really pleasing part of the whole project. When you start looking at buffing with the Carnauba, and generally you'll find Carnauba of that shade that has a mixture of um, uh, beeswax in it as well. Pure Carnauba, slightly darker. Okay, and so the darker sticks, the toffee sort of colour sticks, those are the ones that are pure. Little nothing. Don't overload your Carnauba. You can see the shine that we're getting from that now. Do these stitch mops get to a point that they need to be cleaned? Yes, yes. If you that generally, if you put a little bit too much polish on at a time, what I would do, and I've done it myself, um, what I would do, a little bit of rough sawn timber, and just give it a good polishing with the mop, and that that after a while takes away all the excess, breaks the seal, because um, they glaze over if uh, you get too much on there. And did you say you were on in and around 1200 revs for the? Yeah, yep. well, we're actually at 13 at the moment, but I, I aim to get around about 12. It just hardens the mop up a little bit. And again, there, you can see the shine. And that's a porous timber, that's quite a porous timber. Okay, but still, you get a lovely shine with that. And Carnauba wax does last for quite a while, right, in terms of its shine. Okay, so that's, two stitch mops, one for buff, one for Tripoli, and then the loose leaf mop, the softer mop, for the Carnauba wax. Okay, so two stitch and one loose leaf. Pop those to one side. We've got one more thing to do on this project now, and that's just a very quick sand of those um, stems, and then that's that project finished. So all I'm gonna do there, we're gonna change chucks, and effectively uh, jaws. So that one's going to be replaced with the C jaws. Okay, and we'll close that right down. I'm gonna add my sanding disc that you saw me make a couple of weeks ago. And we won't use the table on this. We don't need to use the table, uh, but all we'll do Lay speed back to zero. We don't want, don't want it too fast. And I'm just going to make a little, little taper. Okay. So just a little angle. 
And then when that's placed in the piece of fruit, you get that, uh, that nice little angle to the, to the stem. There we are. Again, our apple. There we are. Okay, Craig, if you could stand back. So there we are guys, I hope you've enjoyed that one. That's our um, jam chuck held wooden apple and pear. So a lo lovely bit of laburnum, nice and dense, and a nice bit of um, heavily grained oak. Um, all sorts of information in there. There should be the, um, the codes up for you, so you should have seen all of those. But a nice little apple and pear using our jam chucks. Any questions, keep putting them in the comments. What normally happens then is I'll get to answer them in the, the next session. So I hope you've enjoyed that guys. Um, from myself and Craig, um, it's been a pleasure. We're going to look forward to seeing you again, uh, what's today? Thursday, next Tuesday, of course, um, and then Craig on the Wednesday. So thank you very much. I've been Colin Way, and until next time, have a lovely weekend. Happy turning. Bye-bye.